Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, my name is Hannah Catterin, and I'm the assistant curator at the Freeland Museum of Art. First, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Virginia and the city of Charlottesville stand on the territory and homelands of the Monacan Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Tonight, I could not be more excited to welcome Sarah Maple, whose work was featured in our exhibition last fall, Power Play, a Reimagining Representation in Contemporary Photography. Um, the exhibition was co-curated by me, Laura Minton, who's in the back there, um, our curator of exhibitions, and Adriana, who's also in the back there, um, Gretchen Green, our curator of Indigenous Arts of the Americas. Two of Sarah's works are on view um, downstairs, if you would like to see them afterwards. Special thanks to the Arts Endowment through the Office of the Provost and the Vice Provost for the Arts for sponsoring this event and for so many of my Freeland colleagues who helped to plan this. Um, just a quick reminder to please silence your cell phones. Um, and some of Sarah's works reference sexual violence, and she'll be providing warnings a few slides before the works are presented. Please feel free to take a break from the talk or whatever else you need to do to care for yourself while the works are discussed. If you would like to ask a question for the Q&A, um, we will be passing out, or you may already have a clipboard um, with a little card to write on it. Um, and we'll collect those at the end of the talk. And I want to invite you all to a small reception with Sarah that will take place downstairs afterwards. And now for the main event. <laughs> I really am so incredibly pleased and honored um, to introduce Sarah Maple. Sarah Maple is an award-winning visual artist known for her bold, brave, mischievous, and occasionally controversial artworks that challenge notions of identity, religion, and the status quo. Much of Maple's inspiration originates from her mixed religious and cultural upbringing, and she frequently employs herself and her own image as the primary subject through which to convey her message. Maple works across a variety of media, including painting, photography, installation, video, performance, sculpture, and collage. In 2007, she completed a BA in fine art from Kingston University, and in the same year won the Four New Sensations competition run by the Saatchi Gallery. Maple's artwork, film, and performances have been exhibited internationally at art galleries and institutions including Tate Britain, Golden Thread Gallery, and Talent Art Hall. Her recent commissions include the Baltic, New Art Exchange, and Sky Arts. Please join me in giving a big welcome to Sarah Maple. Hi, thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much, Hannah, for just inviting me here and everything. I have such a great time. Um, so, I wanted to start off by talking about a sort of breakthrough moment that I had when I was at art school. And I made this work where I thought, yes, this is the kind of artist that I want to be. So I was in the final year, which was 2007. And as part of the course, as some of you may know well, there are these terrifying crit sessions. And you, as a group, you have to go around each other's work and you give feedback to your classmates. And by this point in the final year, I had done many of these, but on a particular occasion, I noticed a pattern emerging. And I noticed that every time that the men got up to speak, it seemed like we <coughs> automatically respected them and their work, and we listened to what they had to say. But then when the women got up to speak about their work, we were so much harder on them, and it was like we took them a lot less seriously. And the women, as well as the men, were complicit in that, and including myself. And it was the first time I'd actually really sort of noticed that. And so that day when I was driving home, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking how it's almost like we're sort of programmed to respect what the men had to say more than what the women had to say. And it was the first time I truly realised that I may be held back in life because of my gender which seems obvious now, but at the time, feminism wasn't really a conversation that anyone was having at that point. And I literally had no idea about feminism. I didn't even know what it was, really. And this was purely based on an instinctive feeling that I had that something wasn't quite right in that room. So I was driving home, and I was getting really angry and frustrated and worked up. And I was thinking, oh, I wish I was a man, because if I was a man, people would take the things I have to say more seriously. And then this work came into my head. It says, I wish I had a penis, because then I'd fuck you, 
then steal your job. And this highly amused me. So at the end of the crit session, the next one, I plucked up the courage to show my tutors and classmates this image. And up until now, I had literally just been doing paintings of myself wearing berries. So they were not expecting this and they were not happy. And everyone was saying, including the women, oh, what are you doing? We don't need this. We've got it all wrong. Feminism isn't an issue now. And I realized at this point, they were reacting like that because I made them think about something they didn't want to think about, something they'd happily parked in the back of their minds. And I'd unwittingly exposed that thing. And so that was my breakthrough. And in my daily life, I'd always felt pretty powerless. And I had a lot to say about a lot of issues, but I didn't know how to make sense of that or how to express it. And it had never really occurred to me to express it. So when I made this work, it kind of gave me that power and a voice. And I realized I could use art and humor in my work to call out these things that I couldn't really express in my life. So at this point, something changed in me and it was like being let off a leash. So to this day, art is how I make sense of the world and how I process things. So for me, it's all about the message and how I communicate that to the viewer. So that's why I always work in a variety of media because the idea comes first, then I figure out the clearest way to communicate that. So that's why I work in any medium, so performance, video, sculpture, collage, painting, anything. So as long as I'm communicating that in the most effective way. So this is an image called White Girl. And at this point, after that image, I began to make a flurry of self-portraits. And I really began to interrogate what it meant at that time to be a British Muslim. And I feel like I was coming of age in a heavily post 9-11 and post 7-7, which was the London bombings era. And the depiction of Muslims in the mainstream media was pretty negative at that time. And I was feeling a kind of daily battle against that. So for me, there was also a lot of build up of the complexities of being a mixed person. So this painting here, this is called The Past Is Now, and it's from 2018. And this probably depicts it the best. So when I explain my background, I feel like I'm giving a mini history lesson. So apologies for that, but it's not simple. So my grandparents on my mum's side um, were born in the Punjab in India and then moved to Pakistan after pa the partition of India and then moved down to Kenya. And then when Kenya wanted independence from the empire, a lot of the Asians ended up having to leave. So they moved to the UK and that's how my family ended up um, in the UK and how my mum met my British father. And at that time, mixed relationships and marriages were very rare. And it was a big thing that my mum had married my dad, basically. And so much of my work looks at the mixed heritage experience. So this is Fighting Fire with Fire number two. And so in the early 2000s, I began to feel this increase in negativity towards Muslims. And I became really interested in the stereotypes of what it means to be a Muslim and especially a British Muslim. And I had the urge to reclaim this and fight back against that from both sides. So I decided to make my own images and I took a lot of known works from art history and made my own versions and parodies. So. Um, this work is called Blue Badges Burqa. And at the time, there was a lot of burqa stuff going on. It was like every day, there's some sort of story in the Daily Mail about burqas, like obsessively, people going on about it. So I kind of wanted to make a work that looked at that. And um, this work was based on this piece, which is Self-Portrait with Badges by Peter Blake. And he based this painting on this work, The Blue Boy by Thomas Gainsborough which is like a really iconic British painting. And he, um, in this work, I loved because this was 1961 and he was really focusing on the impact of like, Americanization on British culture and how everyone was obsessed with America and wearing denim and Elvis and you know Coca-Cola and stuff. And I wanted to sort of take that and do my own version of it and sort of reframe things and look at Muslim imagery and sort of insert it's Islam into British history and British art history in this way. So this painting is called Haram and it's probably one of my more controversial images. And so for those of you who don't know, um, in Islam you can't eat pork and pigs are seen as a dirty and offensive symbol. And the Quran basically says not to eat pork but 
it doesn't say to you know hate pigs or anything like that but it's become this negative symbol culturally so for a muslim woman to be holding a pig it's quite a shocking image but for me there's so much more going on like at the time i was looking at this difficult period for muslims in britain and it seems so fractious then and i was asking can we coexist can we live together and how does that leave people like me who are mixed and carrying this complexity and history around in our bodies and not being one thing or the other? So I really wanted to touch on the differences between culture and religion as well. And sometimes the culture element is so strong that it overtakes the religion. So for me, it's a very personal image. And at the time, it did receive quite a bit of backlash. So... Um, Talking of controversy, this work is from a few years later when I started to look more directly at feminist topics. This one is called Menstruate with Pride and I wanted to look at the role that shame plays in women's lives and how deep rooted that is and how we carry that around in ourselves and we carry it in our body in a multitude of ways and how can we take that and reclaim it and use it as a form of empowerment so um, just as an aside, my mum was really not impressed with this. And she was saying, oh, it's such a lovely painting. And do you have to have the blood? And I thought, yeah, it's kind of <laughs> integral to the whole piece. But you know, it's a very uncomfortable topic for so many people. And why is that? And so I wanted to highlight that by having this echo of a really dramatic Renaissance painting with an element of religiosity about it, with all these people looking like Armageddon was happening. And you know, how it's kind of distract your attention away from the blood stain and onto the crowd to highlight how absurd it is that we should be shocked or ashamed or embarrassed by menstruation and our natural bodily functions, basically. And this is just a little image of it in situ. Um, a lot of these paintings are all really massive because I always like to do everything huge just to get the most impact that I can. Um, and yeah, and at this point, I just wanted to say that in a couple of weeks' time, I will be mentioning a work that relates to sexual violence. So if anybody wants to take a break, now would be a good time. Um, so another example of me wanting to put an empowering image out there into the world is through my Disney Princess series from 2011, um, which many, many of you may know from the Powerful Exhibition. And um, it's funny because most people call this the Disney Press Princesses in Male Jobs series, which I never called it that. So I think that says a lot. Um, in this work, I aim to question perceptions of gender, especially this idea that men are from Mars and women are from Venus, which is the perception that men and women's personalities and capabilities are biologically determined by their gender. Um, like women are natural nurturers and carers, which is the domestic unpaid work, and that men make the best leaders, so, which conveniently sets men at top of the food chain in terms of money and positions of power. And my argument is that we are the same and we perform gender and we learn how to be male and how to be female from the moment that we're born through everything, um, TV, advertising, popular culture, and the way the world views us and treats us. And then the cycle repeats. And since having my own daughter re uh, recently, I've realised that I see myself doing it and I have to give myself a talking to because I can see myself treating her like a girl and it's something I'm really trying to fight against in my work. So in this series, I decided to send the princesses off into the world of work and give them other options in life. And it's okay to be a princess, but there are lots of other options as well. So this is Sleeping Beauty performing an operation This is Judge Jasmine. That's in a real law court, which is super fun. Um, this is Cinderella winning a seat in Parliament. One of the men in the background actually did lose his seat. He was a, a councillor, he lost his seat before that, so it's a bit of an awkward position for him to be in that photo. Um, this is Belle, the football manager. Got some people around. And this is Ariel conducts a business meeting. And I decided to give them all diplomas and degrees as well. Um, so this was these ones were really fun to do. And the tricky thing um, about doing these graduation pictures was that there's a very like, Disney-esque face that you have to do, which is very like a sort of that Disney face. But it's really hard not to make that sexual. 
and I definitely did not want that. So it was really, really difficult, fine line in the facial expression to make it just that right level of Disney princess, but not sexy. Um, and the facial expression is actually, I would say, really important in most of my works. I think that the facial expression just adds something a little bit extra. It gives you a little sort of cheeky layer or something. Um, okay, so this is the next one. This work's called Anti-Rape Cloak. Um, I made this um, on a residency where the artists were asked to make an object of nuisance, which was inspired by the suffragettes who were often called a nuisance when they were trying to fight for women's rights. So this cloak was born from my frustrations um, about attitudes towards sexual assault and the blame always being put on the victim, so by the abuser and often by the victim themselves. And unfortunately, we've witnessed this in places where we expect better. So, for example, the NHS ran a poster campaign warning women that they were more likely to be attacked if they were drunk. And we even see it in courtrooms. In 2018, a US judge stated during the case of a 17-year-old girl, you have to look at the way she was dressed. She was wearing a thong. There's also, for me, hypocrisies here with the idea that Muslim women are forced to cover in the Middle East with these kind of attitudes as well. And it's also equally ridiculous to think that it's about clothing and that if men see a tiny bit of the female body, it sends them into an uncontrollable frenzy. So this work is an ironic garment that covers a woman from head to toe. And the moment she wears it, she is no longer asking for it. So. I then, um, as you can see, it's detected as anti-rape cloak. And I then decided to put it on and take pictures of myself wearing it in different locations. So this is in the Mojave Desert. And here you can see me on the subway in the Las Vegas Strip uh, in the bedroom. And that's all works together as one series. And I did, this work quite, caught quite a lot of attention and I received quite a lot of abuse for this work. And that's the thing sometimes I think my, a lot of my work is about call and response and so putting it out there and then I'm often like seeing what comes back and having to respond to that. And for me, it's a lot about the conversations that come up from this kind of work as well. So this is one of my favourite ones. Um, <laughs> the opposite to a feminist is an arsehole. And this is quite an early work as well. And this one is probably the one that really winds people up the most. I have to say, this is the one that gets people really frustrated. But for me, it's just saying, if you, if you know, we should all believe in equality, and if we don't, then you're an arsehole, essentially. And for me, I like to take a subject that's really complex. It's almost like too complex to even fathom and try and just break it down into like one thing to get people talking. And like, it's almost like a, a one-liner. So um, yeah, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, and so this actually leads on to the next piece that I wanted to show you. It's a short film. And so at, at this point, I started to feel that I was getting really affected by all the feedback I was getting, and a lot of it quite negative, um, and a, a bit of abuse, basically. So I thought it didn't matter, and I didn't care about it. But then I realized I was sort of second-guessing myself all the time, and I was coming to this artist block kind of thing, and I just thought, Every time I tried to think of something, I was thinking, what are people going to say? What are they going to think? And that was really affecting me and impacting on me. So I just wanted to show you this next work, which is called Freedom of Speech. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the themes in my work. And a lot of people are interested in my work culturally, I've been brought up as a Muslim and living in a Western society and through the media and how the media represents women in the Western world. And so a lot of my work, the process of the work and how I start is I do a lot of reading and research and then I come up with ideas of how I can kind of um, expel my ideas in an accessible way so that I can speak to an audience on a wider level. And to me, that connection with the audience is the most important thing because without that, I don't see how they can appreciate the art or take something away from it. And that's why I choose to show my work in humorous ways, um, in a bold way to kind of grab the viewer's attention. In a recent um, body work I did was looking at Disney princesses and the Disney 
princess brand and how women are showed in a very passive role in, in these films and how Disney still markets them to children at this um, at this time and how even though the films are so are quite old now um, it's kind of relevant they're old because um, I, th I think that it's irrelevant that Snow White was kind of made in the 50s and 60s um, I mean I think it's relevant that she's been marketed um, I think that basically people say with Disney that um, they're trying to make it more accessible to young women today and sort of get away from that passive image of Snow White and Belle or, Belle or Sleeping Beauty. But I don't think that really matters because they're still marketing the Disney princesses from the 50s as if they were relevant now. So, so many young girls are seeing these passive images of young of women and thinking and um, seeing clear gender roles that men are active and take on the world and not girls are passive and I think that does feed into how women, how, how young girls see gender roles as they go throughout their lives and I suppose how we may treat women as we grow up and go into the wider world and I think this definitely does manifest itself in other ways through advertising and the media. Um, for example in advertising um, Gap ran an advertising campaign with young children and in these adverts they had um, adverts for boys and adverts for girls and in this particular campaign the girls were all shown as um, the girls were shown as um, passive where um, standing still sort of looking at flowers looking very sort of demure and whereas the boys were all sort of getting muddy and buying bikes and and taking on the world, whereas um, girls um, were, show, um, were shown as uh, passive. And I think that idea is so um, subconscious um, that we don't, we're taking in these messages subliminally and we're not really thinking about them. So I think in my work, it's a matter of, of pointing out just pointing out these things, I think, really helps because, for example, something like page three, when I was growing up, I just thought that was a, a standard. Um, I just I didn't really think about it and until um, 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 I one day realised what a stupid thing that it was. And, and then only now I can kind of see the absurdity of it. And I think that people are so used to it and so used to seeing images of women in this, in this way that... that we don't, we don't notice... We don't notice them. We don't notice them anymore. So I think it's important to point out, it's important to point out these things so that we can look to how we can see the absurdity of them and how we can change them. Thank you very much for your time. Um, so the only note I've written for this work is performance is great because I basically had the idea that I wanted to talk about my work and then have someone hit me in the face and that was the only idea that I had and it was my husband that was actually hitting me and um, I just said to him you know let me talk for a bit and then but gradually build up the slaps and it's so interesting to me that, you know, after I'm speaking fine and then after the first slap, I'm completely thrown. I, I absolutely don't know what I'm saying. I'm, you know, thrown off. And then as the slaps continued, I just sort of, out of nowhere, became very emotional. And I was fighting so hard not to cry and just really fighting it so much. But I think it just, you know, the, the frustration of it was like, I can't get out what I want to say. I keep being hit. So 
I think that's why performance, I think, is such an interesting medium because like with much of my work, it's so planned and I, I know exactly what I'm going to do and everything. But with this, there was no plan, really. It's just, it just happened like how it, how it did. And um, so I think that what kind of said a lot about how I was feeling at the time and about reflective of, you know, women trying to speak out about things as well. Um, and this is reflective again in this piece that I did in 2017 called A Man's Home is His Castle. And I did a performance which was looking at the refugee crisis and all the people that were coming over the channel to the UK at the time in like rubber dinghies and stuff. Um, and so I decided to build this cardboard castle and um, walk it through the streets of Oslo. And then we stopped in different locations um, and I wrote, there's no place like home on the castle. And it was so interesting because I just didn't really know what to expect. People were kind of following us and talking to us. And it was so interesting how, you know, the castle just became so cumbersome as we were carrying it and it was getting damaged and knocked on the way and falling apart. And it, for me, it was like ev evocative of like that journey and what was happening at the time and the conversations in the UK. So this is a more recent one. Um, it's called Self Portrait with Pocket Square. And in 2001, I found out I was going to have a baby and immediately felt terrified and started worrying about my art career. And even though I know it was wrong, I was worrying if people would still take me seriously um, and how I was going to be viewed from then on. But soon after a few months, that feeling gave away to my usual feeling of just wanting to rebel against everything. So. In this, um, ironic, this is an ironic take on the pregnancy reveal photo. And many of you may know this is a reference to the epic Beyonce reveal photo. And this is kind of reflecting my reaction against the unrealistic expectations on mothers. And I commit the ultimate pregnancy no-no, smoking a cigarette with a look of cheeky defiance. And then this leads on to work that I made last year. Um, it's called Labour of Love. And um, I thought that when I had a child, I would get a rest from art for a bit, but that didn't happen um, because a day or so before having her, I was informed I was doing this solo booth in Art Rotterdam. So I decided I was going to turn it down, but then within days of having her, ideas were already percolating. So within a couple of months, I was already back in the studio making this work. And I've always said that some of my best ideas come from throwaway comments. And this was definitely one of those moments. And I was at one of my parent and baby classes and one of the other mums was talking about her choice to breastfeed. And she said, one of the obvious benefits is that it's free. And I thought, hmm, yes, in one way it is, but breastfeeding is an on-demand, physically exhausting task that women are told they need to do for at least six months. So is that time and labour free? It's only free if you don't value women's time. And for me, that kind of articulated a lot of the points I've made in my work about domestic and care work that's done by women. And of course, having a baby is a personal choice, but it's a choice made by a man and a woman. And what would happen if all women one day decided that this choice wasn't worth impacting the careers and earning potential? So um, most mothers actually end up having to work part time when their pay is lower. And according to research, prospects for promotion are reduced by more than a half. And by the time a first child is 12, the woman is paid on average 33% less than a man. And interestingly, becoming a father actually gives men's earnings a boost as they are seen as a trustworthy family man at work. So the bizarre thing for me about this is that there's this contradiction that if a woman chooses not to have children, she's looked upon with pity or confusion because becoming a mother is what we're supposed to do, right? But then why is that work or the work predominantly associated with women's work considered other or unimportant and disregarded and not valued even by women? So I decided to log every time my baby was fed. And this installation, Labour of Love, is a visual depiction of this data over a three month period. So in total, the baby was fed 650 times. And this installation is 650 images of myself and my baby each representing a feed, each with a hand finish element covering my face. And the aim is to highlight the sheer volume of this invisible work that is expected of mothers and to challenge people to rethink the value of that time spent. And then I did a live performance where I wrote the number of each feed on each card. So um, 
there were so many. As you can see, I, I use so many different things, different mediums like just septic nappies and breast pads and all sorts of things. Um, and I use collage, um, I use charcoal and paint. And I had this great book of breasts and it was so useful for this project, I have to say. And it was a real challenge, actually, because it was six, 650 individual ways of covering myself in some way. So, and I, I really made sure that every single one was sort of special in its own way. So I had to redo quite a lot of them, go back and redo them and stuff. Um, and it was really interesting because I hadn't really worked in this way before, where I was being just really organic again and just using all the materials in my studio, looking around for what I could use. And all these things that I had in my studio take on different meaning, like these fragile stickers. Um, and I had a lot of things that were already cut out that I thought were really great to use. And that glass of milk was a definite bingo when I found that, I thought that's perfect. Um, and I start, I used stitching in my work, which I'd never used before. Um, and all of these things that I cut out previously suddenly just take on this new meaning, like portrait of an artist. And this little text from the female, the female role was taken from a 1970s gynecological book written by a man. It was so funny. It was just hilarious, all the different things written in there about the male and female roles. And some of the most popular ones that have been these ones where I've really scratched out the face in that really aggressive way. And I think a lot of women have really related to that. And this is my favourite one, Women for Sale. So moving on to, um, I thought I'd end with a few cheeky ones. Um, this series is called Portraits with Fans. And here I made images of myself meeting famous male artists. But instead of me being excited to meet them, they are excited to meet me. And I wanted to make work about this power dynamic in the art world and subvert this power play, which still seems very white and male. And women and people of colour are still very behind in museum collections, gallery representations and auction sales. And this really needs to change. So I had a lot of fun taking the mickey a little bit here. And I always had, like to poke fun at the art world a lot in my work. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so that's Damien Hirst. That was my favourite one. Um, Anish Kapoor and Anthony Gormley. David Swerna and Jeff Coons. Mark Quinn. I don't know if he's that well known here, but he's quite well known in the UK. Grayson Perry is like a national treasure in, in England. Everyone loves him, yeah. And Martin Creed, um, who did the famous piece with the lights going on and off. Um, Oliver Eliason, Matthew Barney, and Matt Collishaw. I just want to end on this um, last piece. This is the Sarah Maple Show. <laughs> in 2020, I did this project, which is probably my biggest project yet. And I've always been inspired by comedy and particularly British sitcoms. And I thought, what if you could make a video art piece that took all the sitcom tropes and made it into a work of art? So like a sitcom as an artwork, basically. Um, and what if you actually had it on the TV? And this brings about a whole discussion about what is a work of art and what is the right context for art. And I've worked with Sky in the past and they supported me on this project and they actually put it on TV in October 2020. And you can watch it in the UK on catch up. But if anybody wants to, I don't know if you can watch it here. So if anybody wants to watch it, I can send you the link to that. Um, so this is a semi-autobiographical work that looks at my experience of the art world over the past 15 years. And it's based at a time when I worked in a sex shop and I had no money. And in the film, I suddenly get told that I have this amazing opportunity to have a solo show in six weeks time. And it feels like my comeback moment. So in the hour long film, it's a week by week build up as the pressure mounts to get all these works together. And I have this shady manager called Bruce Bechtel, who is based on a real manager that I had when I left art school. And he's played by an 11 year old boy. And he tells me that the words that people search for on TV are Nazis, sex and sharks which is apparently true. So in a cynical attempt for me to get more clicks, he convinces me to call the show Sarah Maple's Nazi Sexy Shark Show. And so the work changes title halfway through to this ridiculous title. And we had some amazing guests like David Tennant, Will Gomper, Sonia Boyce, Kate Bryan and Nikki Bady. And they were just really, really great and just didn't mind sending themselves up and poking fun at themselves basically in the art world. 
Um, and I've never done anything like this really. So it was the most fun and stressful as it was the same year as COVID. And we had to change a lot of what we planned due to social distancing. And it was actually the first thing that was filmed by Sky when COVID went like back to normal after COVID. But it actually taught me that you can be even more creative when you have a restriction. So it made me work even harder to come up with something more interesting and, and kind of figure out the best way to work around it. Um, but I felt like this challenge was really worth it. And I really wanted to do something that I felt hadn't been done before and kind of push the boundaries and look at what an artwork can be and who, what and who art is available to you, basically. And so last year, this was shortlisted for the Aesthetica Art Prize. And that was really great for all of us who worked on it. And we're really pleased. And um, I wanted to show you a little clip to end with. I was going to show you David Tennant one, but I decided to go with a different one, um, as this is my personal favourite. And I think it gives me a better idea of the overall show. So I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> So let me take you up the arts. Mum, I can't talk right now. I'm stressed and I'm in a rush. Huh? Look at this, Aaliyah. I'm doing an interview for the Nicky Bailey show today. Huh? Did you even listen to what I just said? I'm going on the Nicky Bailey show to talk about the exhibition and it's live. जग हो बार है नी चाहती एदा चीजा देख अच्छा हां जिदा तेरे पिछले एगजिबिशन हाय जो तो मैं अखा बंद कर दी सी आए मेरा अखा मरे ओही दी सी जान हाय ओ रब्बा हाय हाय वेल आई कांट गारंटी दैट सर आप पता मेरा की जी करदा कि तू एदा दी एग्जीबिशन करे जिदा ना जिथे मैं सारे लोका नु बुला सका मम गॉट टू गो आई गेटिंग स्वेट मुस्टाश आए गंदी उल्टी आंदी मेनू सुन के पर तेन मैं बहुत प्यार करदी हां अच्छा What can I do for you today? Well, I'm going on the Nikki Bailey show and I've been told that I need to look good because I have to start thinking about my brand to be recognisable like Frida Kahlo or Andy Warhol. But the thing is, I really like suits, but I'm quite a sweaty person as you can probably tell. And the more nervous I get, the more sweaty I get. And I am pretty nervous because it's the Nikki Bailey show and loads of people watch it. And she's going to ask me loads of difficult questions about my art. And, and the thing is, the reason that I make art is to say things that I can't say in words. And now I'm expected to answer all these questions. And I wish it could be the kind of artist who refuses to talk about her work, like Gillian Waring. But Gillian Waring has won the Turner Prize. Everyone thinks that she's great. And I suppose I'm also great because I've got Bruce Beckler as a manager and I won the Saatchi Prize. But the problem with my work is I'm mixed race, but I appear white. So people think that I'm culturally appropriating, but I'm not culturally appropriating. And I can't explain that because I feel too vulnerable. So instead I say nothing. And then people are all disappointed because I make all this badass work and they expect me to be a badass, but I'm not a badass in myself. I'm only badass when I make art. I'm just a girl from Crawley who likes a cup of tea and a sit down. So please just give me an outfit that I'll look good comfortable in please but also not revealing because my mum's going to be watching and we're muslims and she thinks about my tits when she goes to sleep at night so please just give me an outfit that'll look good and cool in please hmm <laughs> that's interesting because you don't look like um <laughs> is that really all you took from that <laughs> don't worry darling i've got just the thing for you Great outfit. I don't like it. I love it. I asked for two things. One was to be comfortable. The other was to be sweat free. I am neither of those things. You look great, kid. But you know this is radio, don't you? What? You're joking. The most important thing is promoting the show. Focus on that. But I hate talking about my work. Once, when I was at art school, I had to explain my work to the group, and one person said that my work. Actually, looked worse after I'd explained it. How is that even possible? Listen, I've known Nikki Bailey for years. Trust me, you're in safe hands. Firstly, she gets a massive audience, millions. You think Alan Yentorp gets millions? Yeah. You think Mary Beard gets millions? I think not. Secondly, two Indian women. 
You're a Muslim, she's a Hindu, you chalk and cheese. But cut from the same cloth. It's diverse, it's kooky, it's the old couple. It's double denim, but in a good way. So she'll play nice. I know how you lot like to stick together. Well, apart from Anish, obviously. Obviously. So, uh, how many people listen to this? 150 million? Well, good luck. Ooh, one last thing. When you're on air with Nikki, do not mention Gandhi. This is very important because when she was on TV in India, there was this big controversy with a guest and... Sarah, we're ready for you. <sighs> Gotta go. Right. Have fun. Thank you, thank you. Hi, darling. Thank you so much for this. It is such a treat to have you on the show. And you look amazing. You are the art. Oh, thank you, Nikki. I'm a little bit nervous, to be honest. Well, you don't need to be nervous about a thing. Just treat this like two friends having a chat about this fantastic show. Oh, thank you, thank you. I just love having women on the show promoting what we do. The men have been doing it for years. We bitches need to stand together. I firmly believe that. Pussy power. Yes, I totally, I totally agree. And I promise I won't mention Gandhi. Next on The Nikki Bady Show, we take you deeper up the arts with Sarah Maple, an award-winning visual artist known for her humorous artworks that challenge notions of identity, religion and the status quo. Next week she has an exhibition, Sarah Maple's Nazi Sexy Shark Show. It's opening in London and she's here to tell us all about it. So Sarah, you're an artist, but I understand for this new exhibition you're making a sitcom? Well, yes and no. It's six films in the style of a sitcom. Right, okay. Can you explain that a little bit more? Elucidate? Well, um, it's six episodes, all semi-autobiographical, all reflecting on my experience being an artist. So they have uh, genuine friends and family and collectors, for example, and special guests. What, so like Fleabag or Miranda, but with an artist? Yes. Well, not really. This isn't a sitcom. This is video art. Well, the video art I've seen is like an old retro television in the middle of a floor, close up on an eye, shot of a running man, slaughtered chicken, clown jumping up and down, really long shot of the sea. And then maybe a poem that goes on and on and on, you know, that sort of thing. And this isn't that, is it? So how can it be video art? Well, I totally get what you're saying. And even though my films won't be boring, it would still be video art and they'll be here in the exhibition, so. Oh, I see. So it's all about the context. You can only access them if you visit the gallery. That makes perfect sense. It's not as if you can see them on TV as well then, is it? Well, you will be able to watch them on Sky as well. Right, so let me get this straight. You have actors playing roles. You have opening credits, closing credits. You have comedy scenes and a payoff, maybe a comedy freeze at the end, sitcom things like that. Yes. And you can watch it on the TV. Yes. But it's not a sitcom. No. Sarah, help my listeners here. If a sitcom in a gallery makes it art, then why doesn't it being on television make it a television programme? Um, uh, oh. Well, um, I suppose it's important for me to push the boundaries of what art can be and who it's available to. So that's why I've chosen an accessible medium to talk about my life experience, like families and friends and uh, uh, my managers. Your manager? Your manager looks like a 10 year old boy. How is that autobiographical? Uh, for the listener's benefit, the guest just shrugged. You can't question my lived experience. Oh, I thought art was all about asking questions. Um, I, uh, in this sitcom. Oh, sorry, video art. You also claim that Crawley is the place to be. We know that's never going to happen. How dare you? You also claim that David Tennant bought your lollipop lollipop work.
and that my plant by Sonia Boyce was actually your idea. That was my idea. Sarah, come on. My plant is one of the most profound artworks of the 21st century. You can't expect us to believe it was your idea. Exactly. Thank you. That was my idea. I have loads of good ideas. I think your listeners will agree that a sitcom as an artwork is a very good idea. I think my listeners will decide when they watch it on the TV like other sitcoms. It's not a sitcom, it's artist moving image. Fascinating. Tell us more. I thought we were done with the whole what is art debate like 100 years ago with Duchamp's urinal. If people don't know who that is, I can explain oh, a bit more. Oh, please do not patronise my millions of listeners. Duchamp, by the way, if you really don't know who he was, was an artist who put a urinal into a gallery, thereby proving that anything can be art. And that's exactly what I'm saying. These are six short films in the style of a sitcom. I'm not a comedian, I'm an artist. And if I say these films are art, you have to accept them as art. Well, indeed, if we're going by Duchamp's example, then I am an artist too. This cup is art, because I say it is. Well, you can't say it is. Why not? Because you're not an artist. Yes, I am. No, you aren't. I just became one. You can't just self-identify like that. How come you can and I can't? Because I am an artist. I went to art school. I've studied. I've had exhibitions. I've won awards. I've got a lot of Instagram followers. You can't just become an artist. It doesn't work like that. Oh dear, I think we might need to change the subject. You know, with your Muslim heritage, I've often wondered what your feelings about 9-11 are. Uh, my apologies if anybody has caught that rude gesture on the live stream there. I'm sure it's meant to be some kind of high performance art. Only, of course, I couldn't possibly say that because I'm not an artist, apparently. So my next piece of advice is on the opening night of the exhibition, you just need to think strategically. I mean, you're gonna be lucky if anyone comes at all. You're totally unknown and you're a woman. So it freaks people out sometimes. So listen, if they come, be grateful, okay? Prices, yeah, I agree. You could put the prices up. You need to eat, not too much. But, you know, you can't rush these things. Women don't get paid as much as men for ages. Took Villa de Barlo till she was in her 70s for anyone to pay her any attention. You know, you're young, don't rush. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was so great. Um, so we're going to start the Q&A. Um, some of my colleagues will be coming around with clipboards. And I'm just going to start us off with a quick question okay. while y'all are ruminating. Um, Sarah, I know you talked a little bit about this with our docents this afternoon, but I was wondering if you could talk about um, kind of like your journey through different mediums, because you work through so many, um, kind of where you started and how that progressed. And then if there's anything you haven't tried yet medium-wise that you'd like to? Yeah, so um, when I was at art school, I was mainly focusing on painting. I just thought, you know, paint, I'm a painter and that's the most superior medium. And um, one of, I was doing all these paintings and then um, my tutor sort of said, you know, you could do this a lot quicker if you just did a bit of photography and took the pictures. And I thought, oh, I'll just do what they say to get the extra credit, basically. So I thought, I'll try that. And then the moment I got the camera, basically everything started coming out then. It was totally like off the leash again. And um, yeah, I realized that I could use photography to do say, say a lot more and quicker and I could be more experimental. And that, that sort of led on to lots of other things as well. So then I started working more 3D and collage and um, yeah, video and performance. So I will literally do anything. I think for <laughs> basically it's all about the idea. So if I have to sort of think about how I can get that message across in the best way. So often that can be like an idea I've had and then it will take me like a year or so to figure out how I'm gonna get it across in the way that kind of will deliver that message basically. So, yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions for Sarah? Sure. Yeah, if you wanna, Hi, do you have as much fun as it seems like you do that we've just seen? 
I think so, yeah. But it feels like it's more fun after I've done it. During the yeah. time, it's like, ah. Yeah. Like making that sitcom was unbelievably stressful. <laughs> but um, making, the actual filming of it was super fun. And it's so nice when you can look back on it and if you appreciate it after. But David Bowie says that you need to enjoy the process. So now I always think, enjoy the process, enjoy the process, yeah. even when it's really stressful. <laughs> what made us all smile? That's, that's oh, it's always the clues. Any other questions for Sarah? Um, well, we will, we can wrap it up and we can all, oh, yeah. How does he see your dad after that? Um, well, unfortunately he has passed away, um, so he hasn't seen more of the recent stuff, but he was very supportive in his own way. Like um, when we sort of went through his house when, after he passed away, he had all my cuttings in a little drawer and then he had my book and he had all my things. So I think sometimes with the parents, it's quite difficult because sometimes I'm talking about them a bit and their, you know, the fact they had a mixed marriage and stuff. Um, and I think, yeah, I think, I think he was proud. <laughs> yeah, it's funny with parents though, isn't it? Because I don't know, my, my mum kind of agrees with a lot of the things I'm saying, but um, I don't think she necessarily enjoys how I'm putting it across. <laughs> We've got an another question. What is inspiring you right now or what are you thinking about for future works? Um, so, since having my daughter, I've been thinking more and more about my mixed heritage and stuff and thinking about how I was brought up and um, because my partner is British and not Muslim, so it makes me think how can I keep all the traditions alive and stuff like that and um, how do I look at mixed heritage and talk to her about that and um, so I think I'll be making more work. I made a lot of work initially about being mixed and how the complexities of that. But I think I'm sort of revisiting it again a few years later when you know when your life changes and things mm -hmm. adapt and looking at it in another lens and in a different time in history now. So I think I'm looking at that right now, basically. I'm looking forward to seeing those words. <laughs> um, oh, wait. oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you talk a little bit about your decision to place yourself at the center of most of your images? How would using other subjects detract from your works? Um, so I have thought about using other people in my work. And like when I did the princesses, um, I thought maybe it's better if I take the photos and then there's someone else in it. But for me, primarily, it's really fun being in the pictures and I really enjoy that part of it. So that is a joy that I get from doing it. And also, I think, like I said earlier about facial expressions, I think because I'm feeling a certain way about something, I'm putting that across in my body and my facial reactions and everything. I don't think I can explain that to anyone else. So that's why I basically always use myself in my work, um, but that might change in the future. But at the moment, I'm sticking to the subject. Consider them self-portraits? No, yeah. <laughs> I'm always like the girl in the picture. Perhaps I noticed in the video that you mentioned page three, and that probably went over everybody here's, in here's head. Yeah. You might want to explain it. Yeah, I did wonder that. Um, yeah, because in the UK we had a thing called page three, which went for like forty or fifty years. And the, the biggest red newspaper for many years was The Sun. And on the third page was a woman with her breasts out, basically. And that was basically just like a thing that everyone accepted. It's like, yeah, there's tits on page three and no one really ever questioned it. And then there was a big campaign to get rid of it. And they did, I think, about maybe five or six years ago. So there's no more tits on page three. So that was really exciting. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's one of those weird things that you just accept about the British. It's like a British like, like, don't dare take our tits away. Everyone was really upset about it. <laughs> so yeah, tits in context, please, people. Well, thank you everyone so much for coming. We're, we're gonna have a um, reception downstairs. And you'll have an opportunity to kind of mingle and maybe ask Sarah a few more questions. So I'm invite you all to join us downstairs. And again, thank you so much for turning out today. Let's thank Sarah.